Hello, welcome to this new episode of Smarter Tech. I'm here with CC Doucette. CC, thanks so much for taking the time today. I am so grateful to be here to share what's going on with wireless technology today. Well, you've been at the forefront. You're one of the top names that I found in my journey getting educated about the wireless issue and the controversy around is wireless safe, is it not safe? And by wireless, I include in, in their cell phones and uh, all gizmos, e EMF related, and also mm -hmm. all sorts of different electromagnetic fields that we're exposed to. But the reason I wanted to have you on the show today is one uh, very impressive undertaking that you were part of. And uh, that ended up creating uh, an entire report presented uh, at, uh, well, I'm going to let you uh, talk about it. It's called the final report of the commission to study the environmental health effects of evolving 5G technology. And we're going to get into the report, but maybe first for people not necessarily familiar with your work, uh, mm -hmm. nonprofit or otherwise, please let them know a little bit about your background, how you came across the issue and uh, how you came then to work uh, on this report with the commission. Sure. So like most people, I had no idea there could be anything to question about safety and health around wireless technology. Mm -hmm. And when my children were in school, we kept hearing about the 21st century classroom and how they would need all this new technology to succeed in the world today. And our school budgets had been cut to the bone time after time. And so you know, as parents, we jumped in and started doing fundraising. I helped to lead our local education foundation. And we ran campaign after campaign to get wireless infrastructure in the classrooms, yeah. to get iPads and Chromebooks and smart boards and minis and Apple TV and all this technology that we were be to being told was a really great thing to have. And then one night at book group, a girlfriend of mine who's an electrical engineer had been reading um, Anne Louise Gittleman's book called Zapped. Mm. And she just kind of in passing mentioned that there could be something up with biological harm from wireless. So, you know, it was book group, so I just made a mental note of it. But then not long after that, something crossed my desk in writing and I went, oh, I remember Wendy talking about this. If there's anything to it, I want to know. So I started to look and I'm a technical and professional writer by trade. So, you know, as you know, you, you get digging, you start looking at things, right? If you do a cursory search as Wi-Fi safe, you will find assurances that it's fine. But if you go beyond that surface look, you will literally find thousands of peer reviewed published studies showing great biological harm from microwave sickness symptoms such that a lot of people experience today, but they have no idea to connect it to this invisible toxin. So headaches, nosebleeds, nausea, dizziness, pain, anxiety, depression, suicidal ideation, cognitive impairment, behavior issues. The science shows us that this is a neurotoxin. And so I started bringing these scientific studies to my schools going, you know, I think we have a problem here. And I kind of anticipated that had it been like a gas leak in the science lab at school, we would have evacuated the building, fixed the problem before we let the children and the staff go back in. But I got back crickets, like didn't even get a response. And I had been a parent volunteer in our community for 20 years. I was working for the schools at the time as our grant coordinator in the business office and nobody was paying any attention. So I think what happened is that when they read the legal fine print that comes with all of our devices, it tells us right in our devices to keep this device away from the body. So for anybody who's listening with us today, if you have an iPhone, I invite you to take that out and go into settings. Once you're in settings, remember the acronym GAL, like this GAL on Nick's show told you how to find this fine print. So from settings, you just scroll mm -hmm. down a little ways and hit general. If it's an older phone, next you hit about up at the top, but most have upgraded. So now it goes from general down, way down to the bottom of the general list. I think second from the bottom, you'll see legal and regulatory. So just remember from settings, go gal, general, legal, right? That's how you can find it later. Um, and then once you're in the legal and regulatory section, 
there's a little list up at the top and five or six down, you'll see RF exposure. That's radio frequency radiation or two-way microwave radiation that they politely call energy in this legal fine print. And when you take a look at what they're telling us in there, it's just baffling because it's been there all along. And almost, well, nobody I've ever spoken to knew it was there. So it tells us a couple things. One, this device was tested at a distance from the body. So let's think about this. We all walk around with a cell phone up to our ear or we tuck it in our bra or we put it in our back pocket or in our waistband. Right in that legal fine print, it tells us don't do that or you're gonna exceed the FCC limits for public radiation exposure. And the kicker is those limits were never safety tested, Yeah. right? So the other next paragraph tells us to use a hands-free option because that one device now has five or six separate antennas that are constantly pulsing this microwave radiation. There's a cellular antenna, a data antenna, a Bluetooth, a locator, a Wi-Fi, a hotspot. So all of them pulsing at millions and billions of cycles a second with this radiation that we have thousands of studies showing is biologically harmful. So when I brought this up to my schools, you know, they didn't want to hear it. I didn't want to hear it, but they actually formed a committee. And at the end of the day, Ashland Public Schools here in Massachusetts became the first in the United States to even have this little sign wow. that says, Ooh, I'm trying to get, it's, it's reversed, yep. sorry about that. Turn off these things when you're not using them. Only turn the Wi-Fi on when you absolutely need it. And always put the mobile device on a solid surface because even that fine print tells us, don't put it on your body. And so... We became the first. So that's kind of how I fell down the rabbit hole. Then I met with my um, town to see if there was anything that they could do to get information out to the public. And people didn't know about this. The only one in my town who had an inkling was our then town manager. He's since moved on. Um, but he used to be a fighter pilot. And our government still checks in with him to see if he had any fallout from the radiation from being, you know, up closer in the sky to the sun's mm -hmm. electromagnetic field, but also the instrumentation in the, in the planes, plus the radar that's mounted on the outside of the planes, put our pilots in great harm's way. And there's actually uh, reports about pilots getting sick from microwave sickness. So he was the only one who had a clue. Um, I went to our public library and I asked them, um, you know, what they might know about it, how we can help educate the community. And the friends of the Ashland Public Library actually put together a program, a six part program with uh, documentaries. There are excellent documentaries out there called Take Back Your Power, Generation Zat, um, Microwave Science and Lies and others. And then we did some videos around experts giving public talks. We had had some forums here in Massachusetts. So we became the first in the nation to do a six part documentary film and discussion series. And I went after a grant in my community to purchase a radiation detection meter because this is an invisible toxin. And just like, you know, if we've learned nothing from COVID, these invisible things can really take down our immune system, our biology, and the science shows that radio frequency wireless radiation is an immune suppressant. Mm -hmm. So um, Dr. Goldsworthy over in England explained it this way, and I, it really resonated with me because he said our cells only have so much energy. And at night, during our regular sleep, during our circadian rhythm, in the wee hours of darkness, the pineal gland in the brain releases melatonin. Melatonin goes in and helps to clear out the, to the toxins from the day, right? So our cells have energy to do that. But when we expose our cells to toxins that are constantly present and constantly pulsing at our poor bodies, our cells can't do it all. And so then we start seeing chronic illnesses. We start seeing headaches and nosebleeds and nausea and dizziness and infertility and cancers. 
And the science is there for all of that, but it does not get put out into the public media space because our mainstream media has serious conflicts of interest with the industry. So um, I went after a grant to put one of these detection meters on loan in our library. And here in my house, I choose to have as little radio frequency radiation as possible. This green down here signifies the area at which science is still investigating what the biological effects are. Because mind you, there has never ever been a safe level of radio frequency microwave yeah. radiation identified, right? Mm -hmm. When it goes into the yellow, that's where a lot of people have these uh, electromagnetic illness symptoms, headaches, nosebleeds, nausea, dizziness, anxiety, behavior problems that so many are suffering from today, but their doctors don't know, their nurses don't know, their first responders don't know. And I know, Nick, you'll be joining us for the EMF, the Electromagnetic Fields Medical Conference yeah. at the end of January. So that's exciting. Um, I wish I had my cell phone with me. I don't use it very often. But <laughs> I, I often don't know where on, it is. <laughs> I know. I think mine's plugged in yeah. <laughs> somewhere. I don't know. Um, but when we turn on something that emits microwave radiation, you see this spiking up into mm -hmm. the red and just oh, yeah. flaring. And that's what our cells are up against all day, every day, unless we mindfully know to make choices. And like with this uh, podcast that you and I are doing today, I have excellent technology without the radiation. And that just means running a signal back through an ethernet cable. There right? you go. Yep. Somewhere in your home, you've got a router that is connected to whatever, you know, line is coming in off the street, usually fiber optics or high speed cable that's plugged into your router. Well, just go look on the back of your router. You've got ports in there, jacks in there for an ethernet cable. Who would know, right? So then all you have to do is plug that into your device. Like my PC is plugged in to an ethernet cable. I have another ethernet cable that goes right to my printer. I just went into the settings on both and turned off all the wireless signals. Uh, when I figured this out, I had a daughter in high school and one who had just gone off to college at the time. And I was watching my then 15 year old doing homework every night for three hours with her friends with her laptop on her lap. And I'm thinking that can't be good because the science shows us that they've taken male human sperm, exposed it to a laptop with all those antennas radiating, and it changed the DNA. It slowed the motility of the sperm, and it caused far fewer sperm to be viable in just four hours of exposure. And I went, you've got to be kidding me. Yeah. And it was those fertility studies that I read that got me on my feet and got me to pluck up the courage to go talk to my schools in my town about this because nobody knows this stuff and everybody's using a laptop in the lap because it's called a laptop, right? Yep. Well, now they're rebranding the marketing around that and they're calling them tablets. Use it on a table, don't use it on your body. Even the heat, even if you've hardwired it, the heat alone can be disruptive to the reproductive organs in there. So just, you know, little hacks left and right, we can learn to have safe technology. So when my younger daughter grew up and went off to college, um, I sent her a kit that I just went online and figured out and put together myself. I sent her a 50 foot ethernet cable because her router and her off campus apartment was in the living room, a 50 foot cable. I gave her a roll of gaffers tape, which is what they use on movie sets to tape down cords. So nobody is in an unsafe, you know, walking situation. So she just took that and she taped it down and ran it through her living room, through her kitchen and into her bedroom. And then I gave her something called an ethernet switch. Think of it as an extension cord for electronics, right? It's just a little box. You plug in the main ethernet cable to one of these holes. Then you get a couple of short ethernet cables for however many devices you have. In her case, she had, so one hole went for the main ethernet cable, another went for her cell phone and another cord went to her laptop. Well, she likes the Apple products and who would know you can hardwire an iPhone. Yeah, It's not rocket science. 
This is the Lightning to RJ45 Ethernet LAN network adapter. And you can just go online and buy these things for 20 or 30 bucks. And then she likes the MacBook, and that's what she's using for college. And so, who knew? There's a little adapter for a MacBook, right? And then there are similar adapters for people who use Chromebooks or Android systems. Um, this company is just one, and I'm, I'm not pitching any company. I'm not getting any revenue or anything. But there's a company called Pluggable, and people write into the website and say, you know, I have this model of an Android phone and thank you very much, your adapter worked great. Others will write and say, oh, you know, I've got this model and it doesn't actually have an operating system that you can hardwire. So go do a little research before you buy anything, but literally you can hardwire today. It's not rocket science. And then just remember to go in and turn off the antennas in each device. And it's getting harder because the industry is pushing 5G and the internet of things. So my husband, for example, went, our, our TV died. So he went and researched, you know, where could he find one that fit just right inside of our armoire? And he bought this TV and I came home and I went, uh-oh, I'm looking at the <laughs> box leaning up against the wall and I yeah. see a Wi-Fi logo on it. And I went, sweetie, can can that television be hardwired? And we looked and it did not have an ethernet jack on the back. So I went back in the box and went down to the store and I brought my meter with me because then I could actually measure whether there were antennas in there that we couldn't control. So we found a TV that fit in our armoire. We just ran an ethernet cable to the back. We have very good signal. And then we just went into settings and turned off the wireless antennas. So it's not rocket science, but how would people know unless somebody like you or I tip them off. And then there's a plethora of information out there once you know to go look for it. But you gotta be really careful with the industry spin because you know we used to have say 50 mainstream media channels, right? And they would all do independent reporting. They would do true investigative reporting. But over the last decade or two, they've gotten bought up and bought up and bought up and now we're left with what four to six mainstream media outlets that are owned by big corporations that would really prefer that the public not know about the harms of these environmental assaults so yeah and i can i can vouch for that a hundred percent i've been looking at what has been published in, in just the last few years i've been doing that the last four years the nation independent media Epoch Times, Independent, Washington Spectator, Independent. All the independents are publishing similar reports about the conflicts of interest of the telecom industry, the real possible harms from 5G and other sources of electropollution. And then you get New York Times and all the mainstream media who have big 5G adver adverts inside on every other page. And they say, no, nothing to see here, folks. So you're well, like, well, I, I sense a conflict of interest here. Well, I appreciate that you especially bring up the New York Times. Um, there's a two-time Pulitzer Prize winning journalist by the name of William or Bill Broad. And he put out a piece that basically pointed at the Russians and said, it's the Russians fear mongering. There's nothing to fear with 5G. Oh, yeah. And I was like... Whoa, where did that come from? You know, we used to really have trust in one of our nation's top publications, the New York Times, right? So most people will read that and go, well, it must be true. So I reached out to Mr. Broad and I got back a quick response and I wrote back and I said, oh, was that an out of office responder or have I actually connected with you? He says, nope, it's me. And I sent him the peer-reviewed published scientific literature showing great harm from wireless radiation. And still yet, they continue to put out false information. And then when you dig just a little bit deeper, who's got a 5G test lab with Verizon in their corporate offices? Yeah, there you go. The New York Times. When you look to see who serves on their board, you will find additional conflicts of interest. So it's just heartbreaking. I was in a meeting with um, a local school health committee and there were maybe a dozen of us sitting around a conference room table. And as I'm sharing the information and I'm showing the science, like our own 
government, the U.S. National Toxicology Program, mm -hmm. completed a $30 million study over two decades. They had an unprecedented three-day peer review at the National Institutes of Health with world-leading experts who have dedicated their lives to doing the scientific investigation into this. Three days, unprecedented. At the end of the day, their final report says clear evidence of tumors and uh, in the hearts and some evidence in the brain and DNA damage. And then it goes into the adrenal glands and more. Clear evidence is the highest classification they can give from the world's leading toxics researcher. Clear evidence. That should have been the trigger to educate the public. Yeah. And so, to at least, then, at least minimize exposure, because I mean, anyone listening to this who's a tech addict, all the steps you talked about does not does not tell people to shred their iPhone to pieces, go live in a cave or anything like that. You talked about Ethernet cables, minimizing exposure, right? In classrooms, it could be hardwired. So many action steps. The way we're using technology is so stupid. I, I'm, I'm just very... <laughs> Uh, uh, yeah. It's just messed up. For example, routers are always on, right? For no reason. Even I, I'm at home and I use my, maybe I use my Wi-Fi connection an hour a day. Well, the 23 other hours, I'm still getting exposed needlessly on top of that. It's also using electricity needlessly. Yes, and so, that's another dirty little secret of the wireless industry is that wireless and all the systems that power our wireless consume 10 times more energy than hard wiring to the premises and hmm. picking up with cables on the inside. And, you know, if we're going to get serious again with climate change, we have got to get to safe technology, bring broadband fiber optics to the premises. In fact, we already paid for that on our phone bills for years. We paid for hardwired infrastructure. We subsidized it. And then the industry came along and took the money out of that bucket and they put it in their wireless bucket. There's already been a lawsuit called uh, the Irregulators versus mm -hmm. the FCC, and I'm not a lawyer, so I can't really give you the, the ins and outs of that, but it's all online. And what Bruce Kushner and his colleagues did is they went in and looked at the shell game that the wireless industry had done on the accounting. They had taken money from our communities, from our states, and did not apply it to that which we paid for. So they opened up the pathway. Our states can now legally go back and recoup that funding to bring the safe hardwired technology. So that's all out, you know, on online. Um, so I mentioned I'm a tech writer and I got way in over my head with all of this. And then I couldn't remember where there were good resources later that I wanted to share. So I built myself a very simple research repository. It's called Understanding EMFs. And EMF, as we know, stands for the electromagnetic fields of radio frequency, microwave radiation that are pulsed continuously out of this wireless technology. So anybody who's interested in just, you know, don't take my word on any of this. Go do your independent research. If you want to use my research repository as a launch point, just type in CC Doucette, Understanding EMFs and it will take you there. And the reason I mentioned that is I've got a page for legal actions. And there are lawsuits that have been won all over the world. You know, ironically, there was one out of Italy where a gentleman who actually worked for one of the telecom industries was made to use a cell phone to conduct work and to do conference calls. Well, he wound up getting the tumors mm -hmm. all throughout, right? And so he wanted to have compensation for his medical bills and so forth. And the Italian courts looked only at the non industry funded science and they ruled in his favor and he worked for a telecom company but yeah. there are others in you know grenoble france there was somebody who got harmed by the smart meters the utility meters the gas the water electric and solar meters that are being pushed on our homes today are all pulsing this microwave radiation so that when um here in my town there's a truck that goes by once a month, they point their scanner to the meter that's mounted on my house and that's how they get the reading for how much electricity we're using. But even though that takes one second, 
that meter is pulsing 24 seven, many times a minute, which means hundreds and thousands times a day. And that over time can make people very sick. Or if you live in a multi-unit dwelling like an apartment building or a condo, they will put in banks of these for all the different units. And some poor resident is going to be right on top of it or right next to it. And time and again, we see people's health just start crashing because they're getting walloped by these huge fields of electromagnetic energy. So back to that um, health meeting I was in with one of the local schools, as I was sharing this information right there on his iPad, one of the committee members said, well, look, I just looked it up and the New York Times says it's fine. And so yeah. unless you know to dig a little bit deeper, people will take those false assurance and say, they said it's fine, it must be fine. But notice a few patterns. They never talk about the science. They never show science that shows that this is safe. And they stay completely away from the thousands of independent peer reviewed scientific studies that show great biological harm. So when you read something that somebody's trying to tell you that this is all fine and good and 5G is safe and 4G and your cell phone is safe, look at it with a critical eye. Where is the science from the independent scientists who've dedicated their lives to investigating this? That's yeah. the only place we should be looking for our answers. I agree 110%. And you know, Leonard Tardell, who was uh, one of the first one to sound the alarm about Agent Orange being a carcinogen of all mm -hmm. things. I mean, so he's a pioneer in uh, what agents are a carcinogen or not. And he said, you know, if you look at what independent scientists that are actively still publishing on EMFs, what they're saying, there's actually a consensus. There is a consensus among the independent EMF scientists worldwide, and that consensus is simple. They, they differ in their opinions on some things, but mostly they say it's definitely not safe. For sure right. it's not safe. And then we need to figure out what would be the safe amount like any agent, but we're not even there. It's the recognition to say we've got a problem and we have to take steps to minimize. And that I think that's a perfect segue into your 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 last endeavor with that, that report that uh, was, I think, probably months, if not years in the making, called the final report of the commission to study the environmental and health effects of evolving 5G technology. And um, through your uh, wireless ed education and your newsletter, I found this report. Uh, I skimmed through it, and it's it's very very impressive that you were able to put together yeah. uh, a committee and, and and just get to that government level. Because mm -hmm. again, these harms for for us who are in the MS space, they're clear to us. But for most people, it it, it really sounds like like too much. So. How, yeah. how did that project start and um, uh, who is involved with it? Yeah, so that's a great story. I love this story. So, uh, Nick, you may have watched the award-winning film called Generation Zapped. Sure, yes. So Generation Zapped, uh, in a very nice way, walks us through the science, what doctors are telling us, what people who have gotten sick from this are telling us. And it's done by an award-winning filmmaker. So it's just, it's a lovely film. In 74 minutes, Generation Zapped, you can, you can learn about mm -hmm. this pretty quickly. Well, I was asked to co-host a screening at a school here in Massachusetts because the art teacher had become ill from microwave radiation. Her principal was such a good guy, he allowed her to turn off the wireless access point in her classroom. And then she said, you know what, let's educate the community on this. So she brought me in to co-host a screening of the film. And I mentioned that, you know, we became the first in the nation to even start taking precautions. Mm -hmm. So a little bit of my work is featured in the film, you know, my little 15 seconds of fame. <laughs> um, so I was honored to go up there and somebody in New Hampshire had seen the flyer for this film event and came down and joined us. And it turns out she had gotten really sick, like close to dying. She had been to her doctors. She had been to specialists. She had paid out of pocket thousands of dollars and nobody could figure out what was going on until somebody finally recognized her symptoms as, as these electromagnetic illnesses or microwave sickness. So she began peeling it back, removing the exposures that she could control, and she regained her health. 
So she comes down to this film screening and she's so excited to be in a room full of people talking about this because it's very lonely when you learn this all on your own and your doctors have Mm -hmm. no idea what you're talking about. And worse, just like where we were with Lyme disease a a dozen years ago, those doctors who don't know about this will oftentimes go, oh, must be in your head. It must be psychological when it's very much an environmental exposure that's taking you down. So this woman, Deb Hodgson, came to the screening. She invited me up to do a screening at her public library in New Hampshire, and she invited her state representative and her senator, but both of them had conflicts that night and couldn't make it. So then she gets a knock on the door, and it's her state representative, Patrick Abrami, who was up for re-election and was asking for the vote. She invited him into her home, and she told him what her journey had been with wireless radiation. And he listened and representative Abrami is an engineer and our engineers, our physicists, our uh, IT professionals have all been told by industry that there can't be any harm unless you have enough heat emanating from that device to raise the temperature of your skin in a half an hour. That's the only testing that was ever done. Mm -hmm. They never tested it on anything real or biological, right? So he listened and then he went and did the deep dive. So Rep. Abrami did his due diligence and he had this major wow moment like, wow, what are we doing here? So he drafted a bill. Deb introduced me to Rep. Abrami and I took a, a look at his bill and made some suggestions. And then God bless them. They hopped in his car in New Hampshire, drove down to my house in Massachusetts And we just sat around my kitchen table for the afternoon and I helped him to connect the dots on what is really going on with this issue. So he went back and beefed up his bill and he put eight really critical questions in that demand answers. And I'll run through these for our audience really quickly. Yes, please. They're amazing. That's actually part of one of my questions. So (laughs) why does the insurance industry already recognize this radio frequency as a leading risk? And in fact, Lloyd's of London, Swiss RE, Mm -hmm. AM Best and others already know how harmful this is. And they have put exclusions in their policies. So when we allow this toxic technology into our communities, guess who's left holding the bag on damages if there is harm and lawsuits? Our towns need to make sure that there are no electropollution exclusions in the clauses of these applications that the industry is handing over to our zoning boards, our planning boards, our select boards, our boards of health, because there's serious legal liability. The second uh, inquiry is, why do the cell phone manufacturers have that legal fine print in there telling us to keep these devices off of our bodies? And then they have several in here about our Federal Communications Commission here in the United States because they set the amount of radiation that can be emitted out on the public. And we have limits that are way up here, but the biological science shows harm way down here at hundreds of thousands of times below what the industry keeps putting out there. So why Has the FCC ignored thousands of studies, including that U.S. National Toxicology Program study that showed clear evidence of harm? Why do the guidelines for public radiation exposure only look at the heating effect when thousands of studies show you don't have to have heat to have harm? Why does the FCC allow the United States to emit 100 times more radiation than other countries have set their limits to? And why has the World Health Organization in 2011 determined that this is a group 2B possible human carcinogen? Now, when I got into this, I checked in with my Department of Public Health in Massachusetts, and and they sent me back something like, oh, that's the same category as coffee and pickled vegetables. And I went, what? Well, What the public doesn't know is that coffee used to be on that group 2B list because of the chemicals that were used in growing the coffee crop. It's now since been addressed and removed. Those pickled vegetables, there are certain segments of the Asian population that used to cure their pickled vegetables with formaldehyde that was causing cancers 
with excess consumption. So pickled vegetables. So the World Health Organization does not lightly classify anything as a group 2B possible human carcinogen. That's where lead is. That's where thalidomide is. That's where chloroform is. That's where engine exhaust is and a host of other chemicals that I can't even pronounce. So today, the World Health Organization in 2020, because now that we have that US National Toxicology Program study, that was a missing piece of the puzzle. That was one of the main animal studies showing cancer. And so you have to have that before you can bump this up to a higher classification with the World Health Organization. And then, you know, the industry spins everything they can. When that NTP study came out, they said, oh, that's just one study. You need to have multiple studies in order to prove that this is really true. Well, right on the heels of our big study coming out, Italy's Ramazzini Institute that does independent research, mm -hmm. they came out with another study, big study, that corroborated everything we found here. So we now have two major large-scale studies, animal studies, that show the harm. And so the World Health Organization reopened their investigation in 2020. They asked scientists to put their hat, their name in the hat so that they can be considered for this. Dr. Leonard Hardell, the oncologist you mentioned earlier, he put his name in, other credible non-industry funded scientists put their hat in. And what did the World Health Organization do? They chose industry scientists instead. So really? this corruption goes up oh very, God. very high. Who would know that there are two groups at the World Health Organization investigating wireless radiation? One is industry backed, one is independent. So as encouraging as it is to see the WHO open up their investigation again, there's powerful, powerful pockets everywhere. So we're waiting and seeing, we don't hold our breath. Um, but that's what's going on with the WHO and why is the FCC ignoring the science? Um, and then there was a uh, international appeal that Elizabeth Kelly, who's also directing this new EMF medical conference, Elizabeth Kelly worked with the world's leading scientists and they composed an international EMF scientist appeal to the World Health Organization to the United Nations and all the member states saying, we know enough, we have to invoke the precautionary principle. And they put 10 things in their list of what has to be done, including first and foremost, protect children and pregnant women and the elderly and anybody with an existing health condition because our immune systems are already in overdrive Children's immune systems are not fully developed. And now you have a pulsating microwave spike hitting their cells day and night. And we wonder why more than 50% of our nation's children have a chronic illness today. Our bodies are not wired to handle this toxic load. So, and then the last question in this New Hampshire report is why is nobody looking at the cumulative effect so look at a classroom today with this 21st century classroom. Each child pretty much has their own cell phone today. Kids are coming to school with wearables on, watches, Fitbits, whatever. Then you have the classroom issued wireless device, the tablet, and then you have the radio frequency coming off of the wireless access points in the ceilings. And then you have smart boards and minis and Apple TV, and then you have metal. You have metal desks, you have metal file cabinets, you have children with braces, you have underwires and bras, you have earrings. Anything metal amplifies the radiation. It serves as almost like an antenna and draws it towards you. Mm -hmm. So we have put our children gravely in harm's way in our classrooms with all this wireless radiation. And again, Nick, the message is not no technology, it's safe technology. And we know how to do it. It's easy, hardwire. But then go back and look and see how much technology do we actually need? The industry is forcing all tech all the time because that's good for their bottom line. But when you go and you look at the studies on how a child's brain develops, it does not develop properly in the shallows of a screen. 
it develops properly with interaction with trusted adults, with peers, with the environment, all these nonverbal signals that you get when you are learning and living and loving with other people and nature, none of that comes with technology. And now today in the pandemic, we have issued every student a wireless device with absolutely no safety information. And then under the cover of COVID, the industry is taking full advantage and saying, oh, you need better signal? Well, here, we'll put up a 5G small cell right at the curb outside your house. And now your children are going to be exposed to this microwave radiation 24-7. But even if they learn to turn off that device when it's not in use, they can't escape the one at the curb. And we see time and again when these go in, the sicknesses rise. So um, so we are so grateful that Rep. Abrami introduced this bill. So he invited me to come up and testify. I introduced him to Frank Clegg, who's the retired president of Microsoft Canada. And when Frank Clegg was in the industry, he knew enough to not have wireless in his own home, but he didn't really understand it. And once he retired, he had a little more time. So he went and spoke with a dozen of the world's leading doctors and scientists and came back and said, our limits in North America between the FCC guidelines and Canada's safety code six are not safe. So Frank Clegg formed Canadians for Safe Technology and he flew in on his own time and dime. And uh, we testified, Deb Hodgton testified. I think Daphna Tackover with Children's Health Defense, she introduced Rep Abrami to Dr. Paul Heru up in McGill University, mm -hmm. which, you know, I didn't know at the time, but McGill is like Harvard of the United States, but for Canada, so very well respected. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Haru came, he drove down and joined us to testify. And he told those legislators that he has created cancer in his lab at McGill with radio frequency, right? And uh, I also learned from him at another time that radio frequency is what we use to induce diabetes in lab rats <laughs> to oh. then go test things on. I, I wasn't sure if I, could, I I properly cited this one over because I'm a I'm still an amateur reading studies interpreting and I, I'm not as you know a science writer per se and I, I don't have a background to this so sometimes I am a little bit unsure of 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 what to think about it but I read this study where it said we used Wi-Fi signal to induce diabetes in rats and I was like wait a minute. What are you talking about? What does that mean for humans? I mean, we're not rats, but some things that apply to rats and have apply to humans. It, what the heck? It's it's a known I know. thing, it, right? It's and Dr. Magda Havas, out of she's a professor emeritus up in Trent University in Canada. Mm -hmm. She has done diabetes studies, and she has seen that the radio frequency. Um, increases a person's A1C, which is the marker for whether you're keeping your blood sugar stable or not. That's the test that's mm -hmm. done every, you know. So she's done it. She can look under a microscope and see what's happening individually to our blood cells that should be free floating and oxygenating all of our systems. And when we expose our cells to this microwave radiation, under her microscope, she has shown something called the Rouleau effect. And when I was a little kid, I used to eat a candy called Rolos. So that's how I remember it in my mind. It was a little stack of chocolates, caramel chocolates that were stacked up. So that helps me remember the Rouleau effect because what it does is it causes our blood cells to stack up like this, like a stack of coins, right? And then they're no longer free floating. And so now try to get a stack of coins to go where they need to go to oxygenate all of our organs and systems. And then we start getting into sickness. So aside from what the pineal gland and the melatonin are doing in the brain, the Rouleau effect with the blood cells literally glomming together because they're magnetized, right? Electromagnetic fields, they're magnetized and sticking together. So we know those are two definite things that happen with exposure to microwave radiation. And for years, the industry got away with spinning like, oh, there's no mechanism of harm identified in the scientific literature. Well, science has progressed enough to catch up and say, 
we know of at least eight mechanisms of harm. We know about infertility. Um, we know about the cancers. We know about the neurological effects. And that is certainly worth talking about because even before the pandemic, we in most industrialized nations were at epidemic proportions. I think you hit epidemic proportions when more than 16% of the population falls prey to something. We were already at epidemic proportions of anxiety and depression. Now this is a neurotoxin. How long can we leave it jacking our systems day and night without expecting to have fallout? And when you know the industry used to put cell towers 300 feet up in the air in an industrial park, that's where they began. And then they started encroaching. And then they said, hey, aesthetically, if you can paint it the color of a building, you can put these antennas right up on the buildings. Mm -hmm. And then you get a lot of people almost immediately within the first week or two suffering anxiety, suffering depression, insomnia because of this massive exposure, just like with the banks of smart meters. So um, so God bless Rep. Abrami. He got us in there to testify. A number of citizens, biologists also testified in front of the Joint Committee on Science, Technology, and Energy, none of whom understood this issue existed. One of them, there was actually the same day as the public hearing, we were invited to come do a pitch that the industry was giving to the legislature on 5G. And after they did their pitch, one of the state reps said, well, what's this we're hearing about biological effects? And they said, oh, all within FCC guidelines, right? <laughs> Yeah, that's what they say. And it's not a lie. They are within FCC guidelines, but those were never safety tested yeah. and they're extraordinarily harmful. So when we testified, not one of those industry people got on the public record with their testimony, but we knew they were in the room because we had seen them and they have to wear a name tag that says lobbyist on it. So then the bill was voted out favorably by the um, Science, Technology and Energy Committee. And then it was assigned over to the Joint Committee on Health and Human Services. That happened to be chaired by Dr. Tom Sherman, who's an active physician. And uh, he co-sponsored Rep. Abrami's bill. That was a smaller committee. I think there were only six senators on that committee. And so I was asked to come up and testify again. Rep. Abrami represented what Dr. Haru and Frank Clegg from Microsoft Canada had said earlier. And they voted it out favorably from the, the Senate Committee on Health and Human Services. And then it went to Governor Sununu, who signed it into law that you have to form a commission to investigate the health and environmental impacts of 5G. And as the report indicates, um, I'll show you what the report looks like. This is it. I, I went over to my local printer and had them print it and bind it for me. It's 390 pages, but most of that is the appendix. Half mm -hmm. of it is the minutes from their meetings. They met 13 times over the course of a year. They had five or six engineers on that commission, and they had two medical doctors. They also had their attorney general's office, their state level health authority. Um, they invited the industry to be on the commission as well. So there was Beth Ann Cooley, who is uh, part of the Cellular Telephone Industry Association, which rebranded to call themselves CTIA, the wireless industry. She was on that. She said she didn't know anything about the science. Um, and then Dave Juve is the state guy from the industry. He represents local industry you know, priorities. They both sat on that commission too. So we wanted everybody to have their say and then intelligent people will listen do their investigation and make their recommendations. And so for the first time in the United States, we had the industry and the experts at the table. And so they met 13 times. They brought in 10 different industry experts, including the industry's Doug Swanson, who promised to send science along that shows no harm. And he failed to deliver on that promise. He never gave that to the commission. Um, but Dr. Kent Chamberlain was another commissioner, and he's from the University of New Hampshire at the uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. He didn't know anything about wireless radiation until he started doing his investigation and saw how very serious this is. And so Dr. Paul Heru from McGill was actually appointed to serve as an independent expert 
on the commission so he could talk science with everybody, which was great. And then they brought in uh, Dr. Michael Wide from the National Toxicology Program to talk about that report. Frank Clegg weighed in. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, Eric, I'm sorry, I called him Doug before. It's Eric Swanson mm -hmm. from University of Pittsburgh. He's the guy that the industry brings around to give testimony. And then Dr. Timothy Sheckley testified. Oh, yeah. And he has written a policy paper uh, on reinventing wires, the future of landlines and networks. You can go out onto my website and pull that off. It's free and online. And it provides the roadmap. How do we get back to sensible technology yeah. that isn't consuming so much energy, that is sustainable? Fiber optics, you can put that in and it will last for decades. And you can add to it without introducing toxins into the environment. So great resources from him. We had the Environmental Health Trust with Dr. Debra Davis, who's a PhD epidemiologist. She's also a master's of public health. And she has built an incredible research repository called the Environmental Health Trust. And they have arguably the world's best database of worldwide policy actions, science, medicine, and other initiatives. They, by the way, are actually suing the FCC because when that National Toxicology Program study came out, the FCC had had a docket open for years that the public was invited to send information in about whether they should change their exposure limits. They closed that docket after six years. And then when the NTP study was done, the gentleman who now heads up the radiation area of our Food and Drug Administration, uh, that's the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, commissioned that National Toxicology Program study 20 years ago with different people in place. The gentleman today who's in charge of the FDA's radiation control area is Dr. Jeffrey Shuren. He turned around to the FCC and said, basically, nothing to look at here. Keep doing what you're doing. Yeah. And one might ask, it's showing clear evidence of cancer and DNA damage. Why would he say that? Well, again, when you look a little deeper, Dr. Jeffrey Shuren is married to a woman who's a partner in a law firm that represents the wireless industry and other chemical toxic industries. So we're in, we're in it deep up at the federal level. So that's why it's so critical that at the state and local level, people start looking and learning and then working toward change solutions together. So Dr. Davis talked about the science. Her executive director is Theodora Scarato. Um, they too will be speaking at the uh, EMF Medical Conference as will Dr. Haru. Um, and Theodora talked about what's happening all over the world, public policy and schools that are turning off the wireless. And so great information. And then Dr. David Carpenter spoke to the commission. Nope. He has been an advisor to the World Health Organization. And he also talked about the science and why we need to invoke the precautionary measure and start protecting the public now. So uh, there was another retired PhD out of Las Vegas by the name of Herman Kelting. And he talked about 13 objections to 4G and 5G small cell antennas. And then um, right before Dr. Kelting spoke, the pandemic hit and the New Hampshire legislature closed for three months. They had wanted to invite other experts in, both from the industry and from, you know, the non-industry funded science, but they lost that chunk of time and they were going to address smart meters, the utility smart meters too, but they lost that time. And so when they reconvened, they, you know, surveyed one another and said, you know what, we have enough information that we feel confident that we can write a report now. So they formed a subcommittee because they had a November 1st deadline and they wanted to meet that deadline. They didn't want to let it slip. So they formed a subcommittee with seven members of the commission who wrote their recommendations. And that's the 15 that are in the report. Everything from getting our federal delegates to address that section of the Telecom Act that allows the industry to put this toxic infrastructure in at the curb outside of our homes. Also get the uh, federal agencies to assess the environmental impact because it's not just you and I, this is really bad for the birds, the bees, the butterflies, all of our pollinators. It dysregulates their own electromagnetic field 
that's supposed to be synchronized with the electromagnetic field of the earth. So the colony collapses and stuff, they can't find their ways back to the hives um, and, and birds lose their navigation. So we rely on all of this for our own food sources. So if we don't protect the environment, we don't protect us either. So they want the federal delegations to address this with our government agencies at the federal level. And then their um, recommendations that are in this report Again, seven of the commissioners voted these in. The state agency commissioners abstained from voting, but the seven representatives um, who were not state agency folks, they all voted in these recommendations. Um, and I'll go through them very quickly because I know we're coming up to the top of the hour, but get the executive branch at the federal agency to tune into this. Recommendation two, get the state agencies now to start putting out proactively credible information to the public to give them the right to choose to use their technology more safely and to especially protect the unborn, the fetuses, the children, because we know scientifically they are the most vulnerable because their DNA is forming and this radiation damages DNA. The third is to require that if you're gonna put up a poll in the public access way, you have to label it so the public knows this is emitting toxic radiation. You don't want a little kid leaning their bicycle up against it. You don't want kids playing jacks on the sidewalk right there. Recommendation four, schools and public libraries should begin transitioning from wireless technology to hardwired technology. Recommendation five, Nobody's measuring whether what the industry puts up is even within their own faulty guidelines. So we got to start taking signal strength measurements. And then um, recommendation six, we need to start tracking that and putting protocols into place because these pulses are very hard on human cells and environmental cells. So anything that's put in the public access way they're also saying has to be set back a certain distance so that it's within whatever the scientific findings are, not right there 15 feet outside your bedroom window where you're going to get pounded by this day and night. Mm -hmm. uh, recommendation eight is to get those folks who come in and do inspections of our homes when we're looking to buy or, or lease a property. You can hire a building inspector to come test many things like mold and VOCs. Um, and make sure all your electrical is fine, get them trained so that they can also, you can hire them to do testing for EMS. So if you're going to move into an area, you'll know if it's in the red zone before you even sign a contract. Uh, and then take that information from the building inspectors, build a database and create a map. So throughout the state of New Hampshire, people who want to move somewhere can look at this map and go, oh, I can't live there. That's going to make me sick if they already know they're electrically sensitive or if they just want to avoid the possibility that with cumulative exposure, they are going to get sick. Uh, and then recommendation 10 strongly recommends that all new wireless devices come equipped with software that can stop before you put it anywhere near your body. So if you put a cell phone up to your head, it's going to shut itself off because it's going to harm you. If you tuck it in your bra and you forget to put it in airplane mode first, it will automatically shut off. And I think it's Apple. Some of the manufacturers, they already know how to do this, yeah. but we should make it mandatory that you cannot put an active device up against your body because distance helps. Again, no safe level ever, anywhere, but at least creating distance helps for those times when you're on the go and you think you absolutely have to have a wireless signal. Otherwise, just hardwire it. Recommendation 11 is to adopt a statewide position that encourages moving to hardwired infrastructure, fiber optics to the premises. Wireless is not sustainable. And they've just about maxed out all of the frequencies that are available with wireless. So then what are they going to do? So let's stop the wireless now and get hardwired safe technology. Recommendation 12, we need to continue the science. But we know enough today to stop doing what we're doing. So um, there are perhaps ways in the future through quantum physics where we can make frequencies that are biologically compatible with our bodies. So that type of research should continue. 
And recommendation 13, this is to put exposure warning signs in all of our commercial and public buildings, and especially in healthcare facilities and other, you know, um, places like COVID has identified, we need to have access to certain safe spaces, like getting to the grocery store, like being able to see your auto mechanic, like going to the doctor or the veterinarian. We need to create safe spaces or white zones so everybody can safely access the services they need to live their lives. Right now, you'd be hard pressed to go to a doctor who's not doing the exam using a wireless device. Um, so recommendation 14 is that they should start developing radio frequency safety limits to protect the trees, the plants, the birds, the insects, and the pollinators. Do that at the state level. Don't wait for the feds because that could be a long drawn out process. And then recommendation 15, get that federal delegation to go to the National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, and do an environmental impact statement study and tell us exactly what this radiation is doing to our environment. So, you know, bravo to New Hampshire for doing this report. The next step is that New Hampshire legislators need to introduce legislation to take each of these recommendations and do something about it. So we are very hopeful. Um, and we had talked, Nick and I, earlier about there was an emergency law passed in the state of Oregon. Uh, Dr. Lor or Senator Lori, Sa Lori Moniz Anderson was a retired public health nurse. And when her constituents brought this issue forward, being a woman of science, it didn't take her long to look at the science and say, oh my gosh, this is an emergency. So she got a law passed in less than a year that tasked the Oregon Health Authority with investigating the independent peer-reviewed scientific literature. Good. And this was running parallel. Their investigation was running in tandem with the New Hampshire investigation. And we were so hopeful that their report also would call out the industry and the federal agencies for corruption and teach the public how to use technology safely. And unfortunately, the Oregon Health Authority report is just bad on so many levels. First of all, they looked at studies that were not independently funded. So the whole thing should be thrown out simply because they did not fulfill their mandate. Uh, additionally, for whatever reason, they only looked at epidemiological studies. And I didn't even know what that word was when I fell down the rabbit hole with this. But in epidemiology, you study what's actually happening in the world. So you look to see in these areas where there's a cell tower, are people getting sick, right? Um, and they only looked at the epidemiology studies. And I'm thinking that is just bizarre because the National in Toxicology Program study is not an epidemiology study, it's a lab study. So in science, there's epidemiology and then there's in vivo and in vitro studies. One of them is for the lab and the other is for in the body, what's happening when you take blood samples and stuff. They completely blew off all those studies. How can you study a toxin without looking at the full body of science? It was mind boggling. Um, and then they did not have a transparent process like New Hampshire did. When New Hampshire held their commission meetings, the public was invited to zoom in on those. And so we could offer comments from the chat uh, if there was time left in a meeting, they would allow us to speak so we could offer the balance of information that they might not have gotten during the testimonies that were coming in. So New Hampshire did a transparent process. Oregon did not. And in fact, in their um, latest thing this week, they put up a page on the website, I think, for the Oregon Health Authority that, that admits we didn't have the resources. There was no money given to us from the legislature to do a proper investigation of this. So all we did was the epidemiological look. And they talk in their report about infertility and cancers and stuff all being a possibility. And their goal was supposed to be to make recommendations on what do we do in general, but what do we do especially with children in schools? So if you're looking at their report and you're seeing signs of infertility, signs of neurological damage, signs of cancers, why wouldn't you at least invoke the precautionary principle and protect those children in Oregon schools? It makes no sense. But when you step back and look at it, 
So one of the other beauties of the New Hampshire report is in New Hampshire, if everybody doesn't agree, then those who disagree are allowed to write a minority report. So that's what the two commissioners from the industry did. And this Senator Gray, um, he just kept pointing at the federal agency saying, this is the way it is. And he, I don't think he even took time to look at the independent stuff. But inside this big report, after the, the majority recommendations, there's a report in here from the industry for like 10 pages. So you get to see their playbook. You get to look at exactly what they walk around telling people. So that's kind of a gift because now, you know, when you hear this, you know, you better look a little bit deeper. And I think that's probably what happened in Oregon. I think there was probably undue influence from Oregon. Um, we are seeing that this happened in Hawaii too, just this week, uh, Dr. Deborah Green, she headed up a group that got a uh, Hawaii County 5G resolution to ban 5G in Hawaii County. That's the big island of Hawaii. She also was instrumental in getting Maui to offer an opt in on utility smart meters instead of having to fight the system and opt out. You get the right to opt in and just retain your analog meter. So she discovered that I think back in 2019, the Hawaii Health Authority had put out some statement basically saying there's nothing wrong with Wi-Fi. And it sounded an awful lot like what's in the industry section of this New Hampshire report. So we saw the same thing in Massachusetts. I worked with our Massachusetts Department of Public Health in 2016, and we wrote EMF fact sheets that would give people the information to make an intelligent choice on how they use their technology. We were told they would be out in three months. Here we are in 2021, five years later, they have never issued those public health guidances. And worse, they did like Hawaii did and like Oregon just did. They put something out on their radiation control website for the state of Massachusetts, basically saying there's no consensus, there's no reason, but hey, if you're alarmed, you know, do this or that. It's unconscionable when we are harming our children they are our future and it's damaging their DNA. So we have got to learn. We have got to speak up as calmly and professional as we can, because even though we might be jumping up and down inside screaming, we are frying our kids. That's going to freak people out. Yeah. So always come forward with the independent peer reviewed science. And with this EMF medical conference, it's happening next week. And I don't know when you're going to be airing this episode. I don't know. If a it'll little go bit off. later. So people can okay. uh, check it out in case the replays or recordings will be available in the future. Definitely check it out. You know, yeah. I think could we say it's the I know there's been a conference in 2019 in the yes. fall. And this is not officially a follow up, but this is maybe even more important or at least as important mm -hmm. as far as the international experts and medical uh, doctors that are there presenting their research on the fact that microwave sickness is very, very, very real. And unfortunately, this is all real and this is all happening. So definitely check it out because the evidence is there also uh, with people that are treating the sickness. Right? right, the professionals, they, this is undeniable for them. And what I found through my research and my attempts at uh, also educating health practitioners in the last few years on this is that health practitioners do not think it's an issue mm -hmm. until they realize they think about EMFs as a, maybe a factor for illness and then they see it everywhere because mm -hmm. then they tell their their patients or clients, maybe remove that cell phone from your bedside, maybe turn off the Wi-Fi at night. And what happens? People almost instantly sleep more soundly. And some oh. of them realize they were, let's say, hypersensitive or getting sickened because mm -hmm. they are in this fragment of the population that has maybe genetic genetic predispositions to getting microwave sickness, just like you can have genetic predispositions right. to getting yeah. uh, sick from COVID or any other agents. So mm -hmm. You always have a, a slice of the population that's that's more prone to yeah, getting and damage. As, as, as we'll learn in the medical conference, some of it could be a genetic proclivity to be more inclined to become electrically sensitive, but a lot of it can be triggered by environmental exposures mm -hmm. as well. Uh, Dr. Lisa Naj was actually on the Dr. Phil show last week and um, she talks about moldy houses 
can often compromise the immune system and make people much more vulnerable to the electromagnetic frequencies. And so oftentimes people who are chemically sensitive will also become electrically sensitive. So it can be genetic and it can be environmental triggers. And then it can be a sudden large exposure to radio frequency or lower exposures over time that create this cumulative buildup in our bodies and we become sick from that. So uh, it is it is really important to share this information with our own healthcare teams because just like we've learned in our communities, people don't know about it. So it takes those of us who are interested in learning to learn about it and then to go off and share that with others Um, I recommend that if you're going to want to protect your community, do some education with those around you, because if you're the only one talking up to your town, you're really easy to sweep under the rug. So get a group of well-respected, informed citizens together, and then diplomatically go to your towns, present the science. Uh, There's a website called Mm 5gcrisis.com, and at 5gcrisis.com, they have a wonderful toolkit that has they've culled best practices from around different municipalities and they have a sample ordinance that you can take to your town and say hey why don't we start with this get the town lawyer involved bring in a special lawyer who has expertise in telecom law and knows how to put up barriers for the industry so it's not easy for them to come in and get these applications approved maybe one of the stipulations is you have to have an arborist come in and sign off on the application to make sure they're not going to be cutting down or damaging trees as they throw up all these cell towers every two to 12 houses. Uh, Maybe you put in a stipulation that they have to come back. The industry has to come back every year and recertify that this equipment is still viable in the community. And the town would require the applicant to pay a fee to have that annual recertification done by an independent expert, not the industry experts, but an independent expert. And the industry doesn't want to do that. They don't want to pay a fee and they don't want to have to come back every year and address every single small cell. So there are definitely things that we can be putting in our local town bylaws that will make it difficult until this is figured out at the federal level. So 5gcrisis.com, they've also uh, invited groups who are forming to loop in with them and they keep a list in the Mm -hmm. United States, state by state, where you may already have people in your town next door that you didn't even know were already talking about this issue. So, you know, it takes, as Dr. Cindy Russell, who founded Physicians for Safe Technology, Dr. Russell phrases it that it's like a hamburger. You have to inform at the bottom from the grassroots up, you have to inform at the top from policy and physicians and nurses and first responders and somewhere we meet in the middle, right? That's her little hamburger analogy. But Dr. Cindy Russell founded Physicians for Safe Technology and their website is mdsafetech.org. That's another really good one for people to go out to, especially when they open the conversation with their own healthcare providers to have a credible resource among their peers to go look at. And then uh, another resource for the general public and for the work environment is a little nonprofit that we formed called wirelesseducation.org. And, you know, this is such a complex issue and most of us just want to get to the bottom line. So we have taken this complex issue, distilled it down into courses that anybody can take in the English speaking language in about a half an hour's time or less. We distill the science, what the medical recommendations are, what all the risks are, and then we provide solutions for how today you can choose, you know, all these little great hacks to have safe technology. So we have that prepared. An entire school could be trained in a half an hour. An entire workforce could be trained in a half an hour. And we do have overhead expenses because we have to pay people to run our website and to run our course engine. So, but we try and keep it as low as possible. You can literally take this little course for less than the cost of a movie ticket. And then the corporate one is I think under $25, which is unheard of for corporate training. And each kicks out a little tip sheet, you know, handy reminders. Have all the adults in your home, have all the mature adolescents take this because then you don't have to be the bad guy saying we've got a problem here. Level set with the facts up front. 
half an hour. You know, you can say, oh, sweetie, Valentine's Day is coming up or my birthday's coming up. Our anniversary is coming up. Would you please do this for me? Go take this little course. <laughs> and then sit down with that tip sheet Love at it. the kitchen table and go, okay, that was wild. Yeah. What's the first thing we're going to do? Maybe we turn it all off at night. Maybe we decide never to put an active device tucked into our body or up to our head. We'll use speakerphone and wireless headsets and or, um, air tube headsets. It's like a doctor's stethoscope. It's just got plastic tubing with no metal because remember metal serves as an antenna and brings the radiation right up to your brain. So, you know, just these little things. So go to wirelesseducation.org, take that little course. Um, and here in Massachusetts, in the last year, we formalized Massachusetts for Safe Technology. And so you can go to MA, the number four, safetech.org. And you can just pound around there and see what we've done. You could put up a website like that for your own area. California just emulated what we did here. So, you know, I firmly believe, you know, reuse, reduce, recycle. No sense reinventing the wheel. If there's something out there that resonates with you, ask permission. And then by all means, get to it as quick as you can to get information out. So um, I hope that's helpful. It is. Thank you so much. Cece, you're I want, just a personal note. You're an inspiration to me uh, as I was getting getting into the topic and having my own moment in 2015 and 16. Oh, my God, this is such a big issue. Why is no one talking about it? When I read especially Dr. Deborah Davis's book or Dr. Martin Blank's book, the late uh, Dr. Martin Blank, uh, and uh, you're one of the most... Uh, posed and 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 thoughtful speakers that i came across in this field among mm -hmm. hundreds to be honest and uh you were I, I think you're extremely courageous to to go and and uh, and pursue this not only at your local level but you went all the way to the state and federal levels and as an expert witness and in front of committees um I don't think I'd, I'd have the gut. Maybe I would, but that's yeah. very impressive. It takes a lot. And you're an inspiration to everyone listening to this that you can start by just influencing mm -hmm. your friends and your family yeah. and you start can get involved. Are. Start where you are. And, and yeah. you can actually bring change because you did on so many levels and this is progressing, right? We're winning. Yeah. And, you know, I love uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr., Bobby Kennedy Jr. He was part of Josh Del Sol's 5G Summit. Mm -hmm. And when I listen to him talk, he paraphrased Dr. Martin Luther King, who taught us that when we finally get important changes in our society, it comes through three channels. One is the public tunes in and speaks up. Two, it goes through the courts. And three, it uh, eventually causes public policy to catch up and protect the public. So folks joining the conversation today are joining at a really good time because when I fell down the rabbit hole and I think it was 2012 now, I didn't have anybody I could talk to for two years. Mm -hmm. I was just over there on my own determination and grit trying to get to the bottom of this. And now we have incredible resources that anybody can tap into today. Go to that toolkit with 5gcrisis.com enroll in the EMF medical conference training, learn about this stuff, and then use the templates that we have to get your town better protected and use your voice with your legislators. Because I'll tell you, when I spoke to Massachusetts legislators, almost down to the person, not one understood what this issue was. One gentleman, after I spoke to him for about 40 minutes, he said, well, I do actually know a little bit about this. My father was the physicist in Russia who brought the team in to Chernobyl after it blew. So he grew up knowing about radiation, but out of all the legislators I spoke to, not one of them knew that this was an issue. So there's so much opportunity. And now that we have this New Hampshire report, yes. you know, the industry's already out there saying, oh, that's just one state, that's just one report. Look at all these others who say there's no problem. There you go. Yeah. This, this is the foot in the door. This is what we can all reliably use. And the industry's out there already spinning it. So do your research, do your independent investigation, take advantage, reach out to people. I'm blown away by how accessible the experts are. They all want the same thing and that's to protect ourselves and our planet. And we didn't even talk about the satellites they're hanging from the sky to beam this radiation down for 5G and the internet of things. That's a whole nother problem that's trying to get stopped. 
um, but one by one, and you know, I'm just me. I just got a 12 year, a, you know, 11 year head start on most people now. Um, my math is bad. Nine years I've been doing this. Um, so yeah, one person can use their voice and hopefully affect change. And Nick, you're an inspiration as well. I love that you have your podcast, that you took the time to write a book on this um, and to bring it down to a level where people can understand. So, you know, use whatever resources are out there, but just know, know to recognize industry spin and know how to come back and say, well, I can see why you'd think that, but please look at the independent science and try and get your answers from there. And then remind everyone that the message is safe technology and not no technology, which is another industry spin. So don't fall for it. We yeah. all want and, uh, to be on the internet. And, yeah. I think the message should be better technology. Better, exactly. Because Wi-Fi is crummy technology. It's horrible. The signal is poor. The signal is There slow. It consumes so much energy. Your privacy, your information is flying through the air. Anybody with a $100 application out on the curbs can snag your data. You know, so wireless, we were sold a bill of goods. It was convenient, yes, but it's not worth the trade-off for ourselves and our planet. So better technology. Let's go for that. And this is the Smarter Tech Podcast. So that's the idea. Perfect place yeah. to, to spread that message. Cece, thank you so much for this uh, incredible interview today. And I hope it inspires everyone to get involved in the movement. Thank you so much. Thank you, Nick.